So thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, my name is Eliza Yeager. I'm a PhD student in Maria Toskes's lab. And I'm Claire Everett. I'm a grad student in Andres Bendusky's lab. <laughs> I'm Claire Everett. <laughs> I'm a grad student in Andres Bendusky's lab. Um, and before we get started with the introduction, we're going to go over a couple housekeeping points for mainly the people on Zoom. Um, so if you're in the virtual audience to enable closed captioning, please click the live transcript bottom, bot button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and this will allow you enable live closed caption. Um, and then another housekeeping thing, right at the end of the talk, there will be time for, for questions. Um, if you're here in person, feel free to just walk over to that mic in the center of the room. Um, if you're virtual, uh, just type your question into the, the Q&A. Um, if you are a trainee, just let us know by saying trainee before your question and we'll give you priority um, to graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates, if you consider yourself a trainee. Um, you're also free to upvote questions, again, if you're on the, the Zoom, um, just to kind of prioritize those. Um, and again, we'll give priority to trainees. So without further ado, um, we are honored to introduce Dr. Steen Grillner, Professor and Director of the Karolinska Institute's Nobel Institute for Neurophysiology in Stockholm. Prior to joining the Institute, Dr. Grillner received his MD and PhD in neurophysiology at the medical faculty in Gothenburg, Sweden. Throughout his career, Dr. Grillner has established himself as one of the world's foremost experts in the cellular basis of motor behavior, revealing in unprecedented detail how changes in behavior relate to changes at the cellular and molecular level. In his early work, Dr. Grillner demonstrated that networks within the mammalian spinal cord generate locomotor patterns through the coordination of hundreds of muscles. He later created a network model of interacting interneurons in the lamprey spinal cord, a model vertebrate system. His most recent work in Lamprey aims to understand the mechanisms underlying behavior selection and has shown that the organization of the four brain structures, including the dopamine system, has been evolutionarily conserved over more than 500 million years. So we're very excited to hear the update on this research. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Thrillman. Thank you so very much for this very <laughs> kind uh, introduction. And of course, thanks very much for the invitation to, to come. And uh, I have had an absolutely marvelous day today. I have learned a lot about. Maybe you come closer to the to you. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I do have. This. Do you hear me better now? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> very good. So let me see if I can just get this. Uh, I don't see very much on the screen. So, um, I'm going to discuss the brain in action and uh, signified by, uh, by, by, by this uh, little statue. And I will also talk about the evolutionarily conserved control strategies by comparing the uh, forebrain and brain of the lamprey with that of, of mammals. Do you hear me? No. No? no? Okay. So is it better? Okay. Is it still good? <laughs> so, so I will compare the lamprey nervous system, which is the oldest 
<clears throat> in our living group for vertebrates with that of, of, of mammals. And, and I will discuss first in general the brain in action. So, so essentially, I will have three parts. So first, the building blocks that generate action and how they are designed, the microcircuits, and how they are controlled by the forebrain, and how the vertebrate banter system evolved over 500 million years. If you think about, about or look on the little newborn, it's a sweet little survival machine. It can uh, cry for help, it can be fed, it can breathe, and it can a few other things. But during the first year of life, you have a graduate, graduate maturation, the maturation of, of the nervous system. So after about a year, the little child cannot understand, but the kid can walk with them. And what is important to realize is that this is a, mainly a maturation of the nervous system. Uh, experiments done 100 years ago or so with identical twins, one trained and one untrained. The, the trained one started to walk in the morning and the untrained in, in the afternoon. So essentially, it's a maturation process. Although the little child will learn a lot of, of other things. So if one looks at the um, nervous system, you, you have a number of different motor programs. So, so in the spinal cord, you have the motor programs underlying a locomotion which are then controlled from the brainstem. If you happen to be a lamp ray, it's still the spinal cord that generates a motor pattern. If you, <clears throat> uh, you have the respiratory movements, so uh, which are on from through, throughout life, you have the, the networks generate chewing movements that can turn down, is turned on from cortex, but generated in the brainstem. You have the uh, motor maps in superior colliculus, that, and there you can uh, activate different eye movements or orienting movements. In a given point, you will have a movement in, with a certain amplitude in a, in a certain direction, so you have a motor map. You have also the motor programs underlying expression of emotions. What this little guy likes to express is pretty obvious. So, so essentially, what you have is a number of different microcircuits or motor patterns that, that uh, uh, is available. And these, these are just a short list. There are many more. So when you have these different motor programs in the midbrain, brainstem, spinal cord, you need, of course, also to have a mechanism that determines when each of them should, should be, be on. If you take locomotion, that is well studied, there you have the motor programs that generate the motor pattern, the center pattern generators, in the spinal cord that determine when, you, when different muscles are activated. And you have a sensory feedback on that. And, uh, the CPG is turned on from the brainstem in the locomotor command region. That is, com uh, that is and these areas are conserved throughout vertebrate phylogeny. So you have, essentially, this is a circuitry required for coordinating locomotion, for the execution of locomotion, the basic features. And on the top of that, you have then the basal ganglia that provides tonic inhibition and cortex that, uh, that provides excitation. And in order to generate the motor pattern, you need to lift off the inhibition from, uh, from the output of the basal ganglia, and you provide excitation from cortex. So this is a conserved system. We, the design of the CPG is, has, uh, was facilitated very much by uh, Tom Gessels, 
recording or identifying of the genetically defined subtypes of interneurons that form the locomotor CPGs. And although we don't know all details in the mouse CPG, one has sort of identified the subtypes that contribute to part of the motor pattern at, at least. And that's of course a number of laboratories that have contributed, Keen, Golding, Pfaff, and others. The first CPG that was analyzed and understood was that of the Lamprey CPG quite, quite a few years ago. And what was required was then to identify the interneurons that contribute, identify their cellular properties, identify how they connect to each other. And what we then found was that the excitatory interneurons, similar to the V2A here, can generate the burst pattern and independently if they're driven from, from the um, locomotor command centers. And then we have the inhibitor interneurons that, in that uh, coordinate the activity on the left and right side and then the motor neurons. Even if you have this type of information, very detailed information about uh, the connectivity and the network, it's still difficult to understand how it operates. And their simulation has been a very useful tool throughout, throughout the, uh, the many years. And so we have the excitatory interneurons, um, we modeled them and how they were activated. And we could then show that if we have the reticular spinal neurons that activate the excitatory and inhibitory interneurons in a modern system, they, the, with the evidence we had with this data-driven finding could really account for how the motor pattern is generated and also show that with the available evidence, we could, uh, could uh, generate uh, the motor pattern in the natural physiological range. So what it means is that at least, uh, and that is, that's a case where simulation has been very important. And I think in many systems, simulations help you to, to test if the evidence you have can account for a behavior. If you look on, on the other uh, in microcircuits, you have the respiratory microcircuits, you have one group of excitatory interneurons that generate the burst pattern, and then you have follower interneurons, and they can operate without inhibition and generate a motor pattern but you have inhibitory circuits that also contribute. So you have the input there to, uh, uh, that uh, from lung receptors and chemoreceptors that determine the level of activity. But one should not forget that you also have a number of different uh, phenomena that uh, interact with the respiratory. Of course, when I speak, I interact with my CPG and general vocalization requires interaction with this. Emotions interfere, swallowing, sighing, and so forth. So despite the fact that you have a CPG network that generates the basic pattern, it is not isolated. It is um, um, integrated in, in the whole bat. If you take reaching and grasping, it's a conserved motor pattern from frogs to primates. This is this little image makes a point for, for the frog. If you think about birds, when the birds are landing on, the, on a small branch, it, and that's a very qualified reaching and with maintained balance, which is really astounding that they can do. Primates, of course, reach against different objects as, as we do. And if you think about locomotion, when you have precision movements, so you need to place your legs very accurately, then we also have 
sort of a region is shown that the same cortical neurons are engaged in when reaching and during locomotion. So that is the precision walking and that adds to the, what is, has been a very important finding, I think, uh, over the last several years from Sylvia Harper's laboratory is that in the brainstem, you have a group of neurons that when you activate one selectively, you have a reaching movement, reaching out to a target. You have another group of neurons that then open up the hand, and you have a third group of neurons that, that closes the hand and moves the arm towards that. So, so, so we have again a, a brainstem like the circuit underlying this sort of reaching grasping movements. If we take the expression of emotions, Darwin's book from 1872 was very illuminating in that respect. He, he um, saw that, <clears throat> that a girl that was smiling, he, he identified that girls born blind or also smiled. He was writing around the world to see if the expression of emotions were the same in different parts of the world. And the answer was, well, it was yes. So you can see this crying, worried, disapproving, etc. And he did one thing further. He went to, uh, he analyzed the facial muscles with evidence that was just available then and concluded which combination of facial muscles did you need for smiling in crying when you're worried, disapproving, etc. So essentially he had the concept of that you have different groups of muscles that, uh, that generate a motor pattern, like the central pattern you know, generate a network. And this guy again, yes. <laughs> so, so that emphasizes that you have all these different brainstem circuits. The product of gray that is present from lamprey to man is, I think, a very important midbrain hub for the control of specific integrated motor patterns. You have specific compartments activated during, during escape, during and the freezing response, the fighting response, vocalization, sexual behavior, as Don Pfaff has shown, and you have maternal behavior. So, so it, it is like, like a piano, in a sense, playing on, on these different targets. So if you take the escape circuit, for instance, say the dorsal periaqueductal gray, it then uses the locomotor command system for in using locomotion. It has input from, uh, from the, the um, hypothalamus, but also from cortex, superior colliculus, inhibitory input from the nigra reticulata, etc. Et so you have, have this, this essentially, and I mean, one could take for each of these compartments similar type of evidence. So what, what I like to emphasize is that you have this, you saw this slide before, and that you have essentially the same microcircuits expressed also in lower vertebrates. So I, <clears throat> one can say that execution of movements, the execution is mostly a midbrain, brain, some spinal cord affair, dependent on dedicated circuits for each behavior. And, but the planning initiation of movements is to a large degree a forebrain affair cortex, spacer gang, the dopamine system, habenoline, and, and so forth. So, although it's a somewhat simplistic, I think it still applies. I made the analogy now then with an orchestra. 
the different members of the orchestra are like the different microcircuits for different different uh, types of movements, uh, etc. And uh, and the orchestra is is controlled by the director that determines when each of these uh, um, members of the orchestra should be called into action. And uh, what the forebrain does is in a similar way to determine when, when the different microcircuits should be called into action. So to, to make a very simplified description, you can say that you have the downstream motor centers for the microcircuits can be activated from, from PAG. You have the hypothalamus with escape foraging reproduction. This is a sort of circuits for, for execution, whereas the circuits for determining when a given motor pattern should be activated is controlled directly from cortex, but also as important by cortical and other inputs to the basal ganglia that needs to lift off the inhibition, like a permissive type of, of control. So what is the relation between cortex and the basal ganglia? I think it's more complex than what I'm just saying here, but uh, Sylvia Arbor and Rui Costa expressed something similar to this, that cortex may express a wish by the basal ganglia determine whether the wish will be fulfilled or not. It's, I think it's some truth in this, <laughs> but it's not the whole truth. So, so, so let us discuss the basal ganglia first. Uh, this is a human basal ganglia. If we make a diagram here, we have the output of the basal ganglia, substantia reticulata, globus pallidus interna, that provides tonic inhibition. And they are at rest tonically active, inhibiting all the different motor centers downstream. And they also have collateral to salons. And for a movement to occur, or uh, you, you need to activate one subtype of striatal projection neurons, the ones with D1 receptor, D1 excitatory dopamine receptors. And if that's activated, a given target here can be inhibited and thereby you remove the person from, from the motor center. This is, of course, not the whole truth. You have also the other half which is the, the inner pathway with globus pallidus externa, which has, is also tonically active. So when these are activated, these are inhibited, and then you get additional excitation here. So you have these two pathways work in, a, in an opposite direction. And the balance be, between the two of them will de determine yeah, the degree of activity here. But in order for in order to disinhibit the movement, you of course need to reduce the activity here. You also have the dopamine system that provides excitation, that promotes action, and it inhibits the indirect pathway. So that's essentially. And to our great surprise, it turns out that the identical scheme applies both at, at the two ends of the vertebrate phylogeny from lamprey to mammals. I will detail that later. One game changer, I think, was a paper by McElvin from Rio Costa Kleinfeld laboratory showing that SNR is composed of different subgroups of cells going to inferior colliculus, et cetera, 
to different parts of superior colliculus, spontane reticular formation, the dorsal ref, etc. Et and actually, it's more than that. It is they they identified 42 different targets in the brainstem that that are specifically active. So this is like a keyboard where you can can inhibit or disinhibit this. So it's it relates defensive locomotion or a facial oculomotor, hand and muscle tone, etc. What was important also was that the same neurons projected up to diencephalon or up to salamus. And that's more clear in this style. Well, so, so the SNR neurons that projects to the different motor centers and need to be disinhibited in order for a movement to be promoted. Each of these neurons also have a branch that goes to salamus. And in a structured way, so they activate different parts of salamus, different parts of the paraphysical nucleus that project back to stratum, back to cortex. So essentially, what the, the salamic projections are uh, an efference copy of the commands going, going downstream, which is important for the further planning of the next phase of the moment. So another important study, Foster et al, uh, also last year, uh, emphasized that for one thing that you divide the dorsal stratum in the dorsal medial and dorsal lateral, the dorsal lateral have input from the motor areas. But what was important was that they showed that the different part of the motor areas in the frontal lobe project to discrete parts of the dorsal lateral stratum. So you have discrete, discrete compartments of stratum for trunk movements, for hand limb, fore limb, face and face external. And of course, the Jaws and the mouth are very important for an animal. And these in turn project to different parts of SNR. So you have a compartmental situation where, where, where you have different compartments, a labeled line in, in sense from motor cortex to DLS and to, to, to SNR. I mean, that's also, uh, I think, a very important finding that you have a falling barrier, hand limb barrier, and trunk area, et cetera. Now, to understand that, one needs, of course, also to think about the connectivity within each touch module. So, and based on paired recordings in the Silverberg lab and others, we know the connectivity within 50 and 100 microns part between the, uh, the straight projection neurons, the MSNs, if you like, and the direct and indirect pathway, they inhibit each other. We also have the interneurons that target there, and we know the connectivity ratio there, and we know the cortical input to them. So, and that, of course, very important to understand the microcircuitry of these, and you have a SNC. There is yet another dimension to this, and that is that uh, the straighter projection units, MSNs, have apical dendrites, and 80% of the synaptic action is on distal dendrites, like cortex, salamus, and SBNs, LTS, etc. So the action, the important action is on the very distal dendrite. There is also some action by fast spiking interneurons on the, on the cell body that then conveys a different thing. So if one ought to understand this, one needs to consider the connectivity here, one needs to consider the structure of these cells. And we have simulated over 
kind of one more thing. The axon, of, if you have a group of cells that are activated here, there is a local axonal arbors, which I exemplified here, that uh, can provide inhibition. So this is about the size of the forelimb area or something like that. So that uh, so when these are active, they will inhibit neurons around here. Okay. Then to analyze this, and we have we have of course a physiology, etc. But we have also modeled these, and we have modeled these neurons in great detail, so that each neuron uh, performs as their, their natural counterparts, and we have a synaptic interaction. I cannot give give the further information, but you just have to believe me that if you have thousands of these Hodgkin-Huxley neurons, they are activated by a cortical command. Of course, you activate the, uh, the uh, straighter projection units of the indirect and the direct pathway. If you activate the dopamine neurons, you will inhibit these and activate this. So you have essentially the, the pattern that we, we observe based on detailed knowledge of this. What you can do here is also to look on, on the projection pattern. So, so essentially, if we have a group of cells that are activated, we can then look on the lateral inhibition in the surrounding, how big the lateral inhibition and how it sort of decreases over time. What we can also say, and these are experiments that, that are difficult to do <laughs> experimentally, easier to do a simulation. If we then, then record the activity in the distal dendrites here, and we look, look at corticospinal EPSP that, that uh, it can, can be elicited. If we then say the concurrent lateral inhibition, we will then depress this. So, we, so essentially, we have a very efficient way of shunting the corticospinal EPSPs, and that provides uh, activity. We also have plateau potentials generated in the dendrites. We know that experimentally, and we, we have that in the simulations also. And, and if, if you activate the lateral inhibition, you have, will then have a decrease of the plateau potentials. So the interaction in the distal dendrites is very important for what sort of the determines where the, the, the activity. If you, if one then looks, thinks about this in terms of selection of action, etc., then one can have two groups of cells, one activated at a low rate and one at a high rate. They are overlapping partially. And if you take the three hertz, the one with low level of activity, and you activate this, you will have that inhibition, of course, and the lateral inhibition is very efficient. For it, it reduces the activity here with 50%. On the other hand, if you have two very strong overlapping, they, they, you, you have a, a, a very small interaction. So essentially what we can say is that battery inhibition in stratum is acting locally. It's acting on surrounding distal dendrites with a module like the forelimb area or the hindlimb area, et cetera. You have a suppression of weaker concurrent activity, so promoting the, uh, the, the strong activity. And you have a shunting of cortical stratal the EPSPs. And you have interfering. But this is activity that occurs only in one within one module. The other modules do their own thing. So the lateral inhibition cannot sort of account for, for selection or behavior in different parts of the body, but they can do so within a, a limited part. 
So now, so what about the possibility for stratum to help selecting behavior? We have, of course, also the situation that you have a lot of other activity in in stratum. If you not, if you take this example with motor cortex activating the stratum projection neurons, and if they activate these, then you will have the possibility for action. But so so essentially, that's that's critical. You also have uh, the salamic input that can facilitate this. You have salamic input that can activate gap beta neurons that that um, would inhibit this. You have a set of uh, other intermutants in the globus pallidus externa that can provide inhibition. And for instance, for instance the pedantropontine nucleus agrutamate can activate the GABA interneurons very strongly. And then you have, of course, the different modulators, dopamine will promote, etc. So you have the possibility in the entire network to generate sort of a gating of motor commands. So this is a potential motor command, and whether something will happen or not depends also on this input around. But the lateral inhibition can only work within one of these different modules. So how much of the cortical and basic ganglia circuitry existed when the lamprey line of evolution separated from that going to mammals? And that's about 500 million years ago. And let's look, I have already said, yeah, that's a, the lamprey is a vertebrate prototype. Pretty nettic important position diverged from the main vertebrate line 516 million years ago. It has no cerebellum. Um, so, what well, you have seen this diagram before, and I already said that it's similar in Lamprey. And if we look on the details here, one can see that it is something that surprised us immensely when we established this, you have the different types of input from the intratelosynthetic and, and the primary tract type of, of, of neurons. You have from salamus to pangopimus in both lamprey levels. You have the different types of projection neurons with their copeptides. You have the spiny dendrites, inward rectifiers that keep stratum uh, uh, Hyperpolarized when not active. You have other the dark 32, the master switch molecule. You have the straighter interneurons. We don't know if if they have all interneurons, but we know that they have the cholinergic and the fast packing. We know that we have the output pathway, spontaneous activity. Um, the SNR is active, as we shall see and the indirect loop. So to, to a very surprising degree, um, when we started this, we anticipated that we would have a very simplified circuit like, like with the direct pathway or so, but it turned out not to be like that. So just briefly giving you that stratum is small, much fewer cells, of course. It has, as I said, the same input, the same modulators. It, it, it has spines and it has the same type of gene expression as I indicate. If we look on the output cells, in this case, the globus pallidus interna, we have these neurons. They are spontaneously active, as in mammals. And yeah, and this is spontaneous activity. It's not blocked by glutamatergic antagonists. And we have different targets, as we just said for, so for, for the McElvin paper earlier. So it's uh, essentially. So, so at rest, the palatal output of brain cell motor center is tonic and inhibitory. 
Is this an efficient remote design to sufficient to initiate motion at least in in the lamprey? And the, it's simple to do the experiment if you inhibit if you block the inhibition from pallidum uh, to MLR. Do you have uh, do you release locomotion? And in this case, you can see that. That, that when you have injected gabazine to block here, we have rhythmic activity. If you have the body intact, it's pure swimming movements. The dopamine system, a detection of salient stimuli, not only reward. And we have, this is boring because we showing that it's still the same in both cases, been lamprey and rodents. You have the substantia nigra compacta. It, it projects to the same basal ganglia parts. It, 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 explain, it projects downstream in both rodents and uh, uh, lamprey. You did the salience pathway from, pathway, uh, from, from tectum uh, is present, which is very important in that. that uh, salient stimuli activate the dopamine neurons. And if you look at the input, we have the lateral habenula projecting the pedunculate pontine, and etc. So, so this is also making the point that the connectivity in lamprey and rodents are very similar. And if we look on the dopamine, they, they have D1 receptors and they do the, the, the correct thing with the one agonist. We have the two receptors that inhibit, and we have all the TH terminals there. So we have this. If you inject, if you kill the dopamine neurons, you get the, the same type of symptoms with a much reduced locomotive activity, different, difficult to initiate movement but can be done and you also have a rigidity etc so you have the same type of symptoms with hypokinesia etc and just to show that it's it's actually the dopamine deficient that does it so if you inject agonists like apomorphin you can recover the activity so it's the same type of symptoms so how do we interpret these we, um, we interpret this to say that you have modules of D1, D2, um, GPI, GP, etc., that control different patterns of behavior, like locomotion, like different types of eye movements, different steering, feeding, etc. Et, et and whether the modules are called into action depends on pallium cortex and salams. And also the sensitivity of these circuits depend on the dopamine system. So you have essentially, you have a conserved structure here. So it's a conceptual scheme. And what has happened during evolution, because the, the lamprey has a limited behavior repertoire, you have sort of few units like this. But during uh, evolution, you have added more and more units uh, of similar type to uh, account for, for the gradually more complex uh, pattern of behavior. So, uh, so, uh, so instant, but, but one has retained the design of these circuits. So you have uh, have a simply just through acceptation added progressively more units. That's at least our interpretation of that. So the basic building blocks of the basic and that is, is as conserved at least between lamprey and, and mammals. So what about cortex and pallium? So <laughs> The lamprey pallium was considered to be an olfactory area when we decided then to, to, to stimulate there. And 
So this is a tiny little part that is corresponding to what is going to be cortex pallium. And you can compare that with the optic tector. But if we stimulate there, the, <clears throat> one can see that, that we could elicit distinct eye movements. And, um, orienting movements, swimming movements, and oral movements. So there is, and we could show them that you have projections directly from these areas down to different targets in the midbrain. So to make it short, short description, so we, we have a specific activation of, of the optic tectum, uh, which targets the same uh, neurons and the optic tectum that, that they do in, in mammals. We have the projections, the mesencephalon, reticular spine, and spinal cord. We have the same projections to the basal ganglia, both stratum, the subsolamic nu nucleus, and the nagra compacta. And we have the projection to, to, to salamus. So this is, and it's glutamatergic and MDA ampans, of course. So it means that we have the same projection pattern uh, with, of course, much fewer neurons, etc., uh, that we have in, in mammals, to our great surprise. And if you look on the input to stratum, we, also, we have both the intra telencephalic neurons that, that excite PT neurons and go only to stratum. And we have the PT neuron type that via collaterals activate stratum, but also makes downstream. So, so that's, if we then look on the, cortex. So it has a molecular layer and it has two uh, inner, inner layers, one with more GABA neurons and one with less GABA neurons. So it's, it's three layered. If we look on the proportion between GABA and the neurons, it's about 22% and about 78% with the metallic neurons. So this is in the same range as, as in, in other cortex. If you look on the, the properties of the PT neurons, so we have neurons that were integrated, we can see that you have the cell body and you have dendrites going up to the molecular layer. A clear difference is that you have, we, they, they uh, ramify in a much larger area of the molecular layer than the primal tract neurons in the in mammals that are more, more limited. But uh, they are spiny. And uh, we have put two types, one, one type that are ready for spiking and elicit only one spike on stimulus, another that is, uh, uh, gives rise to burst activity. So it's the same sort of type of them. So is there a sensory representation of the amplitude cortex? And again, to our surprise, we found that, that if we stimulate different parts of retina and we record in the visual pallium, we, we, we get different, we, we get the response in, in, in cortex. So we have have the, and the different quadrants activate neurons in the different areas. So there is a retinotopic representation of the visual area, which also was entirely unexpected. We then also looked on the, is there a somatosensory representation here? And what we could see is that we, we do have an area for, for, for the head 
and another area for, for the trunk. So we have indeed a visual area, somatosensory area, and the motor area recorded there. So this is clearly not only an olfactory area. Now, what about olfaction? We could show uh, last year that we have mantra-like cells and tufted-like cells. And tufted-like cells uh, originate, uh, uh, project into a very specific area, the DMTN, and the mantra-like in the sort of the ventral part of pallium, what you could call the piriform. So we have a dorsal part here with motor, somatosensory, and visual, and then the olfactory here. And, and one should also note that in mammals, the mitral like provide uh, project broadly to this area. The tufted like project a very limited area where it's then channels further. So there are also similarities in, in that. So, so if, if you then look on, consider these are two extremes. What could there have been in between? We have uh, the dorsal part of pallium, if you like. And this is from Briscoe and Ragsdale, modified slightly. We have the ancient reptiles that then, then uh, gave rise to mammals and neocortex. We also have the development uh, reptiles with contemporary reptiles and the dorsal ventricular ridge, etc., and which with dinosaurs and crocodiles and birds. So, so, so you, one has these two, two different evolutionary lines. And, um, and uh, so, so that's essentially what we have. Of course, there is many question marks in between here, but it would seem like that. Yeah. Evidence, this evidence is of course only physiological, but um, uh, from Arendt and Kessman's laboratories, there, there is a, a description of the cell types in uh, so reconstructing the ancestral vertebrate brain using a lamp in your cell type atlas. And this very much confirms our image. So, so essentially, this is from them. So they conclude that at this point, you have the cephalic expansion, you have a four petite brain, you have a three layered pallium, you have the lateral medial ganglionic eminence. You have migration of GABAergic continuums, you have basal ganglia and dopamine system, abdominal and reticular spinal neurons. But they conclude that, that we lack, uh, or that the lamp relaxes cerebellum and then oligodendrocytes. So one doesn't have myelin, but um, in, in the lamp nervous system. Of course, we have. Uh, so, I mean, this, their, their conclusion is that there are many similarities in, in, in cell types. And, and of course, we have, have the complementary and elegant studies of Maria Toshes and, and her colleagues on, on, on reptiles and also amphibians that are complementary, I think. Uh, so, my conclusion here is that the design of the vertebral forebrain apparently was invented very early in vertebrate evolution. And much of this design has maybe been maintained. So the lamprey probably the evolution invented. <laughs> um, um, we have the sangodonts, which is the type of reptile that then, then linked, links to the development of mam mammals. 
that would seem likely as an interference. You have the three-layered cortex, which in mammals have that. The, uh, the basic ganglia, S and C, have been that I haven't spoken about, but that's also also conserved. So, uh, so I, I think this indicates that very early in vertebrate evolution, man, many of the major features of the vertebrate nervous system was uh, had had evolved. What one has to remember at the same time is that you have orders of magnitude fewer nerve cells. So, uh, so the processing is of course uh, very much more limited. But the bow plan the, was apparently to a large degree created very early. And what is of course complicated is to realize what happened between the tunicates that are very modest and and this and that's probably not available in the fossil um, collections. So okay, so what I've tried to argue is that you have these parts for execution and the, the forebrain of basic ganglia to a large degree for selection of behavior initiation. And here is my, <clears throat> my dear colleagues. Much of the work that I spoke about today, the, the simulation is Jeanette, Jeanette Hellegren and Johanna, Alex and Johannes. Much of the basic work on, on the basic ganglia is, is Jean, Marcus Stevenson Jones, and on paleo, it's Reyes and Britta Robertson that has been a very important member of, of the lab for a long time. And Peter Valen for my very early work. And I'd like to pay tribute then to the lamprey, which the Finns have made a stamp of, but not the Swedes, not as yet at least. So we have simulated the lamprey. I didn't talk about that, but this is the same basic features. It has a basic ganglia, and this learned to swim towards blue, but not red objects. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.